Good morning. <clears throat> uh, my name is John Sproul, and I am your service leader this morning. And I'll be joined by our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it's good to have you with us. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but are connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. Let's all take a moment to quiet ourselves and any electronic devices you might have brought with you as we enjoy our prelude played by Gordon Ritchie and Reverend Rosemary Morrison. A duet this morning. Thank you, um, Rosemary and Gordon. Uh, everyone, welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, and special welcome to anyone who might be visitors or guests with us today. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together, not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawing from many sources. Whatever you believe or don't believe, whoever you love, however you understand family, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We begin our gathering acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit. And now we will be having the chalice writing, lighting to begin our service. I'd like to call on Coralie Cairns to light our chalice candle as I read these opening words. Deep calls into deep, joy calls into joy by Gordon B. McKeenan. Deep calls unto deep, joy calls unto joy. Light calls unto light. Let the kindling of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of love, of peace, of hope. And as our one flame lights another, nor grows less. We pledge ourselves to be bearers of the light when, wherever we are. And now, if people uh, would open um, their hymn books to hymn number 257, and uh, in the sanctuary can stand if they're willing and able to join us in Twas in the Moon of Wintertime. And those who are on Zoom, the words will appear on your screen. So uh, hymn number 257. <laughs>
will now light our Advent wreath. I don't know about you, but I got caught up with the non-English words, so I just hummed the end. And if you did too, that was okay, or if you sang the English words, that's, that's okay. So, Advent wreath words for four Sundays by Megan Dowell, uh, adapted. We are entering a time of year where the earth grows colder, animals begin to hibernate, and days become continually shorter. This morning marks the third Sunday in the season of Advent. In the Christian tradition, Advent is be the beginning of the church year, recognizing the transforming power of God in the world and looking forward to the birth of Jesus and the celebration of spiritual light. Christianity is not alone in celebrating light this time of year. Hanukkah, solstice, Kwanzaa, Diwali, there's, it's just so, so much. All involve candles, fire, and lights as part of their celebrations. We light one candle for each week of Advent to remind us that the light of these candles guides us toward personal peace, share joys of the season and opportunities to build love in our church and in the larger world. We light the first candle as a symbol of hope and expectation. And then we light the second candle as a symbol of our longing for peace. This morning, we light the third candle on the Advent wreath. The lighting of one candle after another reminds us that this season must pass in its own time. Birth cannot be rushed. We light this candle as a symbol of joy that cannot be contained and must be shared. Advent asks us to proclaim our gladness as a gift to others so that even those who are weary will still feel the fullness of it. This joy leads to strength and the ability to be transformed. May we, together, individually, as a congregation, practice joy through our words, our music, and the way that we live our lives. And I would like to ask Maria Jenkins to come up. Maria is, an, is our Interim Director of Religious Exploration, and she is going to do our children's story for us. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's. Staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm, lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now, hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, too, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming. I must find a way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow, he knew, all the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early and rush for their toys. And then, oh, the noise. Oh, the noise, 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 noise. That's one thing he hated. The noise, 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 noise. Then the Who's young and old would sit down to a feast. And they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, 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 feast. They would feast on Who pudding and rare Who roast beast. 
which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then they do something he liked least of all. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand, and those who's would start singing. And they'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this Christmas who sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea. An awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat. And he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he chuckled and clucked, what a great Grinchy trick. With this coat and this hat, I'll look just like Saint Nick. All I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around, but since reindeer are scarce, there was none to be found. Did that stop the old Grinch? No, the Grinch simply said, if I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog Max and he took some red thread and he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, get up! And the sleigh started down toward the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark, quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were all dreaming sweet dreams without care when he came to the first little house on the square. This is stop number one, the old Grinchy Claws hissed, and he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fist. Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch, but if Santa could do it, well, so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once for a moment or two, then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue where the little who stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant around the whole room, and he took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn, and plums and he stuffed them in bags. Then the Grinch, very nimbly, stuffed all the bags, one by one, up the chimney. Then he slunk to the ice box. He took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out the ice box as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took the last can of Who hash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee, and now, grinned the Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. And the Grinch grabbed the tree, and he started to shove when he heard a small sound, like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast, and he saw a small who, little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter who'd got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? But you know, that old Gr Grinch was so smart and so slick, he thought up a lie and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little tot, the fake Grinchy Claus lied. There's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there, then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child. Then he patted her head and he got her a drink and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou Who was in bed with her cup, he went to the chimney and stuffed the tree up. 
Then the last thing he took was the log for the fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other whose houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other whose mouses. It was quarter past dawn, all the who's still abed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled, packed it up with the presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. 3,000 feet up the side of Mount Crump Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo poo to the who's, he was grinchishly humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the who's down in Whoville will all cry boo hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put a hand to his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so. But it was merry, very. He star stared down at Whoville, the Grinch popped his eyes, then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought doesn't come from the store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? What in Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. Thanks very much, Maria, for having our Grinch-like hearts now grow three sizes. Uh, larger, which is a perfect time to uh, share our abundance, which is one of the purposes of this church community, is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. In addition to supporting this community here, we also make a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of the identified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. And for the month of December, we are sharing our abundance with RISE, Reconciliation and Solidarity Edmonton. It's a not-for-profit society founded in 2015 in response to the one-year anniversary of Truth and Reconciliation Commission's national event in Edmonton. RISE is made up of people from all walks of life committed to moving reconciliation forward in our community. The objectives of RISE are to raise awareness of the lasting impacts of the residential school system, to create safe places for conversations about reconciliation, to offer opportunities to learn more about and engage in Indigenous culture. 
and they're offering plates located at each of the sanctuary exits here, so we invite you to leave a donation at the end of the service, those who are here. And for those of you online, you're encouraged to make a donation to RISE through their website. We thank you for your generosity of spirit and action through all we do here in this community and the wider world. We're involved in the important spiritual work of creation and compassion. And if everyone online and here can join in seeing from you, I receive. I'll just do a, a short reading. Uh, when Rosemary asked me about, um, and Gordon, about helping with the service, they said if there was anything that uh, I might want to contribute. And one was I found there was an old poem that by Robert Louis Stevenson. And I don't know if people remember the counterpane poems by Robert Louis Stevenson, but he was uh, very ill as a young child. And he spent a lot of his time in bed, and he made up stories like Treasure Island and various things. And he did write one story given it's a joy of wintertime service, called Wintertime, which he imagined as a young boy sitting in his bed looking out the window. So I thought I would share that today. Wintertime by Robert Louis Stevenson. Late lies the wintry sun abed, a frosty, fiery, sleepy head. Blinks but an hour or two, and then a blood-red orange sets again. Before the stars have left the skies, at morning in the dark I rise, and shivering in my nakedness by the cold candle bathe and dress. Close by the jolly fire I sit to warm my frozen bones a bit, or with a reindeer sled explore the colder countries round the door. When to go out, my nurse, nurse doth wrap me in my comforter and cap. The cold wind burns my face and blows its frosty pepper up my nose. Black are my steps on silver sod. Thick blows my frosty breath abroad. And tree and house and hill and lake are frosted like a wedding cake. I invite you to open your charcoal hymn books to hymn number 55, Dark of Winter. And I invite you to stay seated to, to sing this song. Okay, so we're gonna, this is going to be part of our meditation time this morning that will include the song, a guided meditation, and then our candles of joy and concern.
we can bring the lights down and just close our eyes and hum through that once more. Just throw that out there. Have a desire to just sit in the, in the still and the quiet and listen and hum with you. So I invite you into a time of continued quiet reflection, of meditation, of examining our inner life. Take a couple of deep cleansing breaths in and out, breathing in life, all that sustains us, and letting go of all that we no longer need. And do that for a couple of breaths. And just ask you to draw your attention, if you will, to whatever it is supporting you, to ground into it, to feel that you are supported in this physical world and also in the emotional world, the spiritual world, the personal world. Where is your support coming from? And I ask you to just take your hands and give them a squeeze together. And then gently give each finger a little pull and, and rub, squeezing on your fingertips a little bit. Go through each hand each finger one by one. If you want, if not, just sit quiet. Maybe do it later on your own in privacy. And then take your thumb into the, into the center of your palm and just give it some, just give it some love especially down in this part here, in the fleshy part under your pinky finger and under your thumb. And then give their hands a squeeze together. I don't know about you, but that felt really good. Thank you. And then take a couple more deep cleansing breaths. And then just let your breath be natural. And bring yourself back into the room if you've, like me, have kind of left it in my mind. And each Sunday, most Sundays, we come up and we light candles of joy and concern. And this Sunday we will be doing that as well. And you may notice that there's two, two stations. So we've tried to make them similar. So line up on each side, light a taper, and then go to the candle station and light a candle, extinguish it in the water, and then go back into your seat.
I invite you to light candles of joy and concern as you wish and on your own time. Let us just take a moment and hold all of these. Oh, I'm sorry, Marilyn. I didn't realize. Thank you. Let's take a moment and ho hold together all of these joys and concerns for each candle represents a longing, a desire, a disappointment, a loss a grieving, an anger, a resentment. It represents something. And so we together celebrate all these things together that makes us community. Thank you. So the reading for the message this morning is by Thomas J. Sims, and it's called Let's Unplug the Christmas Machine. Christmas has become a time of financial and emotional stress. Let's fix it. And this was posted December 7th in 2018 in Psychology Today. And he says... In 1991, authors Joe Robinson and Jean Stahili wrote the book, Unplug the Christmas Machine. It's a well-written, powerful piece that both explains how commercialism and stress have depleted the Christmas spirit, then advises how, reader, how the reader can put back love and joy into the Christmas season. The holiday season is a busy time of year, and what should be a time for love and joy? Many 
have turned into a hectic period of stress, splurge, expense, and a cornucopia of attending activities that must be endured, even though they are rarely looked forward to. He's talking about the before times. There's shopping to be done, menus to be planned, cooking and baking to be finished before hordes of people arrive. Then there's the never-ending scores of presents to be decided upon, purchased, wrapped, and placed under the tree. Most distressing of all is the fact that Christmas has become the epidemic of commercialism and stress it now is. Not because we want it to be, but because we have been conditioned into thinking of so many of the things we feel must do are necessary to make Christmas merry for those we love. Christmas, or the holidays, has become a time of both emotional stress and financial stress. He says, a survey done by NBC News in 2012, so it's fairly old, revealed that a staggering 45% of Americans, and I would assume it um, relates to Canadians as well, would prefer to skip Christmas because it causes so much financial pressure and anxiety. This time of year also causes time management stress as well as wallet stress simply because there are so many things we want to get done, yet time is limited to do them. I'm adapting a little bit from here, but in a research study performed by Greenberg Gulen Rosner Research, they say holiday stress has a particular impact on women who generally take charge of holiday celebrations more than men. And I would say that's very generalized. Holiday stress has an impact on lower middle income individuals. Emotions run high during the holidays. Many report feelings of love and happiness at a far greater rate. I was talking to someone earlier and they said, I was asking them what their favorite thing about Christmas was and they were just said like Christmas, they had a fairly tumultuous time growing up and they said Christmas is so triggering for me because it was a time in my home growing up when things would just go haywire. So like don't ask me my Christmas favorite Christmas thing as a child, I kind of just tried to hide. And so I think that happens for a lot of folks where Christmas can be a real trigger for some folks, especially with addiction issues. People look forward to the holidays because they will be spending more time with loved ones. That makes sense to me. The things people like least are the financial burden and the emphasis on commercialism and consumerism. Uh, the study also found that more people connect with their spiritual faith at a higher rate during this time of year. Interestingly, most people who experience stress during the holiday season take no action to reduce their stress. I can tell you for sure, this is me, I did some abridging and now it's just me talking. I can tell you for sure that I have experienced holiday stress in all of its forms in my life. Sometimes I was just so glad when it was all over and the kids were back in school. I used to call that, that day back to school, the most wonderful time of the year. And I'm sure many of you can relate to that, and many more who won't be able to relate to it. The expectation this time of year is that much money will be spent, greetings sent, decorations put up, baking done, all of it. I can't imagine what it's like for parents these days now with kids having um, access to the internet. And by the way, I really do miss the Sears Christmas catalog. <laughs> Oh, I loved, and the Eatons. Remember the Eatons? I mean, I'm really saying, <laughs> uh, my age is showing, but I love the Eatons catalog. There's an old story. Um, a, resor a resource business set up somewhere, and it was near the turn of the, toward from the 1800s to the 19s, 1900s, and the, the owner could get people to come and work for, for them for a bit, 
And then they would stop coming in for their shifts. And, and they were asked, why won't you work? Why won't you come in and for your shifts? Maybe it was a mine or something, I don't know. And they said, well, we have everything we need. We were fine for a few months. We don't, we don't need to work anymore. Thanks, thanks, but no thanks. I'm good. I'm going to stay home with my family. The owner of the resource, resource business thought long and hard about that, that and then decided he would send the Sears catalog to every employer's home. His situation soon changed, and folks were clamoring to fill the shifts. I think there's a powerful message in that story. We only re know we need something when we're shown all the things we can buy. And don't get me wrong, I'm preaching to myself. I'm, I'm, I'm a shopper. And we, we, if we think we're going to miss out, we're going to go and get what we need. If we don't have a microwave, we're going to get a microwave, or kids, the latest gaming system, or the greatest whatever. And that seems pretty obvious, and we are completely bombarded with advertising. I don't know if anybody watched the Mad Men, that series. It was set in the 60s, 70s, and just the ideas, the, the thinking that went behind advertising that to, to uh, manipulate us through, advert, for, through television. That's why television happened, was for advertising. That was the reason for it, was, was it was developed by advertisers. Now where was I? So let's talk about reducing the holiday stress for a moment. And Sims has a few suggestions for us. Most of them are pretty intuitive, like get an early start, make a list, be picky about what you decide you can do, Prioritize and only do the things you really want to do. Of course, like I said before, this, this uh, article was written before COVID, so we're, we are not doing all the things that we were once doing, all the entertaining. He also suggests that you ask for help and try to limit the spending. And here's one that I think is really important. Practice good self-care. All easy for things for him to say, but how do we actually let go of all those expectations and actually settle into and experience the joy of wintertime, the joy of this season? I suppose not just between now and January 1st, but throughout this time of shorter days, longer nights, and with the cold about to settle in. This is my first winter in Edmonton since I was a teenager. I lived here as a teen. And I know I need to make friends with the cold. And what are some of the things you have discovered to help you get through? And I'm asking this because you're going to talk to one another. We haven't done this since, uh, since I started here, but one of my favorite things to do every once in a while, I like to get you guys talking to one another. I can only come up with so many ideas. You hold the wisdom, not me. So I'd like to break you into groups of two or three. The Zoom host has already been notified, and he will be putting folks, Jeff will be putting folks into breakout rooms, the uh, heads up. And uh, so I'd like you to go break into groups of two or three. Stay in your family groups if you can, um, and maybe sit with someone you're comfortable with. But please maintain as much social distancing as you can and still here. Keep your mask on. Don't touch one another. It's going to get noisy. And I'm going to love it. I just, I'm going to love the noise. All right. So let's sit for a moment and think first about what you wish to share about the season that you enjoy. What do you like doing? Share it with your, with your talking partner, your conversation partner. Well, like I said, while we do this, the Zoom host will be putting people into breakout rooms of two or three folks. So the task is, share something you particularly enjoy about this season, what brings you joy, what makes you feel cozy and happy this time of year. Give each other ideas about how to get through this holiday season without so much stress. 
and how to add more joy during this winter time. Ready, set. One, two, three, go. Okay, we're back. The Zoom people have come back to the main room, and um, I just want to say that as I put people into the rooms and groups, I realized that it probably messed up the video recording, and I just want to apologize for that. So, thank you. Thank you for your flexibility. How was that? Isn't it so nice to talk to people about things that are important, isn't it? Yeah. Well, they, get paid, they pay me to preach, Marilyn. I got to do a little bit up here. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoy that part of things, too. So can someone, maybe, if there is um, a word or a phrase that stood out for you in your group, um, I'm going to need to repeat it back into the microphone, so just a couple of words or a short phrase that I can remember. And Is there anything anybody wants to bring to the main, main floor? Music is so important, isn't it? That piece that Gordon and I played this morning, um, my daughter and Elizabeth and I have been playing that. Um, that's why I played the bottom. I always played the bottom. We've been playing that together since she was little, and it's an important part of our Christmas is that Christmas duet book. What else? Connecting to our pagan roots. Connecting to our pagan roots. There was someone else. Christmas lights, yeah, yeah. One more, pardon? Friendships. Friendships, Friendships. absolutely. Did um, anyone talk about uh, service to the community, that that was a highlight of your Christmas time or holiday time? Hmm. Um, I, wanted to, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, pardon me? Walking outside. Walking outside. And reading indoors, walking outdoors and reading indoors. When I worked at Big Brothers Big Sisters in Kamloops, the staff would volunteer at a fundraising breakfast that the local radio station put on. There was a drive through toy drive. You drove through and dropped off an unwrapped toy and, and everyone that went to the breakfast had to bring an unwrapped toy and pay a lot for their breakfast uh, to augment the gifts. I'm sure something like that happens here in Edmonton as well. I don't know. Um, the executive director of uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters would say, this is when Christmas or the holidays start for me. I don't get into the holiday spirit, he would say, until that morning when I am serving others their breakfast. And I see the generosity, the outpouring of generosity from the community. And I kind of wonder if that's not what it's all about too. Finding ways to help others to buy, by giving to organizations that lighten the load of those financially challenged, whether that is by giving money if you can, or volunteering your time if you can, or both if you can, or hoping that you can in the future. What I'm trying to say to you is this. This is kind of where it all comes down. Even though this time of year brings with it so many expectations, I urge you to think about the things that are actually really important, those things that you talked about this morning. And I bet those things do not include overspending or over anything. I want to suggest to you that we have been told that in order to do this season correctly, we have to give in to the advertising, the expectations, the have-tos. Otherwise, we're not doing it right. Instead, think about what is most important to you and do those things. For me, as I'm hearing from you, it's about visiting with family and friends, enjoying walks in the snow like Andrew, playing board games, decorating cookies, reading a good book, Zooming with family and friends I can't be with. So what can you let go of this holiday season to make it a little bit less hectic? 
less expensive, less all the things that get in the way of good self-care and actual joy. So let's dig into the cozy time of the season and reduce the consumerism and expectations that we have been conditioned to comply with. Let's unplug the Christmas machine and look for the joy that can be ours this winter time. So may it be. Amen. And hymn number 244, it came upon a midnight clear. And I believe this was written by Unitary. Am I, am I correct? Yes. It came upon a midnight clear, hymn number 244. Please rise as you are willing and able. And to everyone online, it was me who messed up the hymn. Um, now it's time to extinguish the flame. And I'll call on uh, Corley Cairns, who lit the flame, to uh, extinguish it for us as I read these words. Deep calls unto deep. Joy calls unto joy. Light calls unto light. We extinguish this flame, keeping kindled in us the inner light of love, of peace, of hope. And as one flame lights another, nor grows less. We pledge ourselves to be bearers of the light wherever we are. And now we have closing words from um, our minister, Reverend Rose. And I offer you familiar benediction words by L. R. Nost. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break, and 
things can mend, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So go and love intentionally, love unconditionally, and I urge you to love extravagantly. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that you carry within you, so go and share it into the world. Amen. Announcements. Such so anticlimactic. I just they, they don't really fit anywhere, but if there is something, David, you want to speak. use its influence to get assistance to uh, members of the former Afghan uh, support group for the Canadian military. These people are in deadly danger, although Canada has been out of military operations since uh, 2014. Uh, they are hunt the Taliban are hunting down and killing people who assisted the occupying force. The government of Canada has, you know, it's basically sort of like Lewis Carroll's Cheshire Cat. The last thing you see is the smile, but you don't see any action. Uh, they've said they want to get Afghans over here, but they are doing very little to uh, encourage in a desperate situation. I have information packets I'm speaking, I might add, as a, a member of a group of old men uh, who once attended military college together. Uh, we've gotten pretty upset at the government in action and are trying to get some indication of support in the country for what we see as a moral obligation. These people helped us. I was incidentally opposed to Canadian participation and I have a column that I wrote at the time, which fortunately I found on my computer, uh, because I wasn't opposed to some of the objectives, but I just thought they were not going to win, and they didn't. And it's setting up a horrible situation. Thanks. I'll be around afterwards if anybody wants to speak to me. As I say, I have some information packets. Thank you, David. Andre? Can you say it from there? Is it? Yes, I can. And I'll repeat. Someone told me actually at Toronto State College, I have them here and I have five there. If you're looking for stuff and stuffers, that the, the, uh, the money goes to the interfaith community. So uh, multicultural uh, Calendar. mul calendars, multi religious cal calendars for sale. Audrey has some, and the proceeds go to the interfaith um, society. Thank you. Um, I wish to thank everyone that participated and contributed to this service. We cannot do this. We am so grateful that we are able to have people on Zoom with us and be able to be here as well at the same time. It's very wonderful. And now I would like us to sing Carry the Flame Twice. If there anyone that does not know this, what we do. All right. Um, so we're going to sing Carry the Flame Through Twice. Um, arrange yourselves, do not touch, <laughs> and uh, it will be lovely. <laughs> Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace.
Okay, so that's the end of the